Good morning, Ebenezer. Won't you join me as we pray? Most gracious and heavenly Father, we are coming this morning, first giving you glory, honor, and praise, and thanking you for this beautiful new day. Thank you, Lord, how you have watched over and protected and kept us safely through another week. We're so grateful, God, for your goodness, for your grace, and for your mercy. We are not a perfect people, Lord. We are sinners saved by grace. But we ask you, Father, right now to forgive us of our shortcomings and may you forgive us of our many sins. Lord, sometimes we say and do things that we shouldn't. And sometimes, Lord, we go places that we shouldn't. And we're not obedient to your will, but we thank you for being a forgiving Father. So forgive us right now, we pray, our Lord. God, today is a brand new day, and we're so thankful for the opportunities that you have provided for us. For our Ebenezer Baptist Church, Lord, how we're able to come together in this medium. We're grateful, God, because so many people are not able to get on the phone or not even able, Lord, to come out or hear a word in any other way. But we have a blessed church, God, and a blessed leadership. We ask you to continue to be with our pastor-elect, Dr. Adam Baum. We ask you to bless and strengthen him and keep his family. We ask you to bless Sister Somerset, Lord, for the work that she's doing, for the uplifting of thy kingdom through Ebenezer. Lord, we are thankful because there is so much in our lives that could be different. We're praying, God, for those whose families are dealing with the loss of a loved one. Many have journeyed on to be with you, God, and so we just pray comfort to those families. May they know, God, that you're with them during these trying times. Lord, many are sick. Many have been sick for many days, but we know, God, that you're with them, and we thank you for healing that has taken place, and we ask, God, that you continue to provide for them the comfort and healing that, they, that our membership needs. Lord, we're grateful because there are times like no other times before. A virus that we know very little about, Lord, that has pervaded our land from sea to shining sea. But God, we thank you for those who are working diligently on a vaccine and for those who are working diligently to try to eradicate this disease. We thank you, Lord, for those that have been saved from its illness. And we thank you, Lord, that there are times coming where we won't deal with this anymore. As we journey forward in faith, Lord, we lift our fellowship and the leadership of Ebenezer and ask your continued blessing. We pray for our city, state, nation, and world, the leaders, God, and the decisions that they make on our behalf. Give them discernment, O oh God, we pray. We ask, God, that you continue to lead, God, and direct each of us in the way you would have us to go. But most of all, God, we pray that we would be obedient to your will and to your way. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and all that you will continue to do. In the precious name of our Lord, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.
Good morning to the Ebenezer family. Many thanks to our worship participants on this day for the words that have been offered by way of prayer and for the music that has been rendered in the lyrics of our songs and those who have sung them this morning. Uh, again, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and I look forward to all that God is doing in our lives that we might reunite at some point in the near future, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, uh, that I might see your smiling faces and no longer have to preach in this empty uh, sanctuary from uh, each week. God be with you in all that you are doing. Uh, God be with you in uh, every way that God can possibly be with you so that we might uh, know God's love and feel God's presence even as we are apart. I invite you to turn with me to our scripture lesson for today, Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. From the New Revised Standard Version of the text, you will find these words. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him, walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and, begins to sink, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. My brothers and sisters, just one word for the title of this sermon. Believe. Believe. This scripture lesson follows the feeding of the more than 5,000 people that we read about last week. After the meal, Jesus sent his disciples ahead of him. They traveled by boat on what was the Sea of Galilee. Jesus also sent away the crowds and used the time for quiet, for reflection, for prayer. One may imagine that he needed a break, wanted a break even. He might have needed a recharge to give himself the strength that he needed to carry out his ministry in the world. So this space of quiet and reflection is something that he took advantage of as he sent both the crowd away and sent his disciples on before him. This picture in the scripture then provides a contrast in terms of what happened with the disciples and what was taking place with Jesus. While he was in a quiet place for prayer, the disciples were starting to experience the rough waves of a storm on the sea. Matthew wrote that during the evening, the disciples encountered a storm that rocked and tossed their boat. I am sure that the fishermen on the ship had experienced such conditions in their time on the sea. They knew about rough waters. They knew about the storm. Having experience with it, though, does not make it any better when you're going through it. 
As a matter of fact, it is that in Jewish writings and in Jewish beliefs of that time, the sea was a place of terror and of death, of chaos and in many instances, confusion. The Jewish people had an uneasy relationship with the sea. So Matthew painted a picture of this moment for the disciples as one that had to have induced some real fear within them. The literal translation of this text even is that there was an earthquake on the sea. The boat, moreover, if we were to take the word literally, was beaten physically by the wind and the waves, Matthew stated. The reader who understood the language in her or his time, the Jewish reader that understood what Matthew was trying to convey in the original language, would have recognized that this had to have been a fierce storm. In addition to the description that Matthew gave us, we also read that the boat was far from land, far from a place in which they could dock and have sturdy footing underneath their feet. They were pushed back by the storm and the place that represented safety was far away from the disciples. The destination was not within reach. Yet, as the night turned to dawn, they began to make out a form of something or someone in the distance. In the morning, we are told, Jesus appeared to them walking across the water. The disciples could not determine what or who it was that was on the sea. One may presume that these men had not seen a person walking on water in their lifetime. That guess was probably, uh, that it was a person was probably not the first guess that entered their minds. Maybe the fishermen on the boat who had probably at, in times in which they were bored had told stories and legends of people who faced off against sea monsters and lost and only their ghosts now existed haunting the seas for eternity. You know how we do things when we get bored, when we're at a camp or when we're around the campfire for our Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, when we are riding on a long trip, we tend to talk about old stories or we tend to some might even make up ghost stories around such uh during such times so it was that maybe some old fables and some old folk tales had entered the minds of the fishermen as they were on the water and they said it is a ghost my grandmother hails from mississippi and she would sometimes tell the uh, tell us about the ancestors' belief in haints. Now, uh, some of you who might be watching or listening are too young or might not know anything about that concept of haints, but I encourage you, if you ever have a moment, to read Toni Morrison's Beloved, and you will uh, become quickly familiar with the idea of spirits that haunt us and sometimes hold us in fear. Here the disciples were on this boat being battered by the winds and the waves and they see what they believe is a ghost, an apparition in the distance. They thought Jesus was a ghost until he spoke. Jesus, we are told, walked across the water to meet up with the disciples. And he encouraged the disciples by telling them that it was him who was with them, coming toward them. Do not be afraid. It's not a ghost, it is I. I am here. The sound of his voice must have caused some relief in the boat. As a matter of fact, we begin to get a sense of who Peter was in this response to hearing Jesus' voice. Peter responded right away, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you. I wonder what Peter really expected. Did he think that it was not Jesus? Did he believe that it was a ghost and that he would not get a response? Place a pin right there. I want to come back to this idea a little later. Jesus told Peter to come to him on the water. Come! And Peter did just that. 
While Peter was walking on the water, he realized that the storm had not stopped. If you read this closely, if you go back to your Bible and look at that text again, you will see that Matthew does not say that the storm ended at this point. We will not get to the end of the storm until verse 32. You have to understand, Matthew did not forget to tell us that the storm was over before verse 32. The storm was still raging in Matthew's telling of this story. The storm was still raging when Jesus saw the disciples. So Peter stopped thinking about what Jesus told Peter to do and what Jesus told Peter he could do. And Peter started to focus on the storm. When that happened, we see the results. Peter became scared and started to go under the water, started to sink, the text tells us. Family, I believe this moment is instructive for us all. For some people will tell you that Peter lacked faith in Jesus, and that is the reason why he started to panic and started to drown. But I do not believe that, this, that his lack of faith was uh, in Jesus was the problem. As a matter of fact, I don't believe that he lacked faith in Jesus. Peter's problem was a, a crisis of confidence in himself and in his partners. May I take a moment to explain this? Peter believed in Jesus. Think about it. He said to Jesus, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And when Jesus said, come, Peter got out of the boat and headed in Jesus' direction. Did that display a lack of faith in Jesus? Let me go a little further, for I believe that was an act of faith in getting out of that boat to start walking on the water. But if that's not enough for you, let me share one more thing. The second demonstration of Peter's faith was in the fact that when Peter started to go under, Peter cried out to Jesus, Lord, save me, recognizing that Jesus was uh, someone who could save him from going all the way under. Why would Peter do these two things if he did not believe in Jesus? Jesus' statement and Jesus' question then in response to Peter invited Peter to do some real introspective work, some real digging inside, some real probing and searching and thinking about where was his faith? My sisters and brothers, Peter's problem was not in his lack of faith in Jesus. Peter's problem was a lack of faith in himself and in his partners. And if we are honest, we may find that when challenging moments in our lives occur, we lack confidence in ourselves and in the people around us. What can save us, though, from these crises of confidence? And what can position us to get to the other side of our challenging times? Well, if I were to answer that, I'd offer just one point for this Sunday morning. If we are going to be saved from these moments of doubt, these crises of confidence, and work through our fears to get to the other side of such challenging moments, I believe that we ought to remember that God wants us to get through these times together, to get through these times with each other, supporting one another, holding on to one another. Matthew wrote that Jesus was walking toward them. That's the scene that we have. When they were in the boat and it was being battered and when morning time came and they saw this, this presence in the, in the distance, Matthew tells us uh, in the text that Jesus was walking toward them. This action is a reminder of God's willingness to meet us in our toughest times. I do not want to read too much about Jesus' intentions, but I can imagine that he was going to walk to them and hop in the boat with them. Why else would he leave his place of prayer to get out uh, to, to go and walk across the water, to walk across the sea. Why else would he do it? My brothers and sisters, Jesus was on his way to the disciples, yet Peter was ready to get out of the boat. Jesus was getting ready to get into the boat with them, I believe. And here Peter was getting ready to hop out of the boat. 
Friends, one of the things that I hate to see as a pastor is when the tough times hit, one of the things that some people do is they immediately choose to go it alone. They double down on their efforts and try to make it out, try to make it without any help from friends and family. I got this, they say, I can, I can handle this. They choose to keep it to themselves, not to share their problems, not to ask for prayer, not to get some help and some assistance from people who are around them and who will be in their corner if they simply reveal what is going on. They say, I've got this. You know people like that. You might be a person like that. All the while, they tend to dig themselves, dig for themselves deeper holes. In the text, Peter did not say, if it is you, tell us to come to you. Instead, Peter said, if it is you, command me to come to you. There were at least 11 other people on that boat with him. There were at least enough people on the boat, even with some experience in how to steer the boat, how to make it through the storm. But Peter chose to create his own out, a path for himself and not for everybody else. If Peter would have been patient enough, Jesus would have arrived at the boat in due time. Since Jesus was close enough for the disciples to hear him, he had to be close enough for Peter to wait for Jesus to get in the boat. Jesus left the mountain of prayer and met them on the stormy sea. He reminds us that God has that type of care for us, that Jesus is willing, that God is willing to be in the boat with us. Why do we choose to get out of the boat when there are partners, there are people, there are resource people who can bond together and work it out as we await God's presence, as we eagerly await God's presence for how God will see us through whatever challenges may come. As believers, as Christians, as people of faith, we sometimes fool ourselves into believing that there should not be storms in our lives. We hear preachers that tell us that if we have enough faith in God, bad things will not happen to us. I get disappointed when I hear such bad religion, such bad theology. Friends, storms will come in life. The winds will sometimes slow our progress. We may not arrive where we want to be when we want to get there due to the challenges in our lives. Yes, sometimes, we take the detours and we create the problems. And sometimes the problems arise based on no fault of ourselves or of others. If we are not careful, we might allow all, all of these forces, whether we cause them or not, to crush our sense of self and alienate us, push us farther apart from the people who care about us the most. But that's why this text is so instructive. Peter not, might not have handled this situation the best, but he was right to call on Jesus. Jesus caught Peter during Peter's crisis of confidence and put Peter back in the boat. Jesus placed Peter back in his starting position, back with his team. Jesus re reunited Peter back with the church, so to speak. Jesus brought Peter back into the fold and placed Peter back with the people who would love him and support him. So I love the ending of this story because it may be that there are people right now hearing my voice who need to be placed back on the boat, who need God to remind them that there are people in your corner, people who love you, people who care about you, people who are willing to give the shirt off their backs to make sure that you succeed. When you find yourself in your toughest moments, God is calling out to you, ready and willing to aid you. God wants you to believe that God has equipped you to make it through trying times, and God wants you to believe that God has given you partners and people who are your teammates for this journey. When your nerves are shot, when there's more month than there is money, when you have lost your way and don't know you're up from your down, your right from your left, 
when your health is failing, when you can't, when you don't seem to have enough strength to make it on your own, God wants to put you back in the boat, so to speak. Do not be afraid to call on God. God wants to encourage you. God wants to reconnect you with people who will support you through your most difficult moments. And that's a part of the way that God works. We sometimes look for the miraculous and God's trying to put us back and show us that the miraculous is right there with people who are willing to go through the tough times together. No one else got out of the boat. No one else tried to go for him or herself. And I tell you, when you feel like you cannot stay in the boat, hold on. Help is on the way. So what an appropriate ending that Matthew wrote for us. When the disciples saw what happened, they worshiped together. They realized that God was working on their behalf in and through Jesus. And it said that the storm ceased. Let the church say amen. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with all of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. Go into the peace of God, my Ebenezer family and all who might be hearing my voice on this Sunday morning or whenever you access this video or the audio or whatever the case may be. May God keep you all the living of these days. 